Vicente Reynal believes that a lean mindset combined with employee ownership are the cornerstones of establishing a successful company. Reynal is the chairman and CEO of Ingersoll Rand, a global market leader in mission-critical flow creation and industrial solutions. From compressors, blower solutions, and tools to precision liquid and gas pumps, Ingersoll Rand encompasses over 40 respected brands where its products and services need to perform in the most complex and harsh conditions. Renal and his more than 17,000 employees across the globe are using lean tools to drive daily outcomes of productivity and efficiency for its customers, shareholders, and communities. Renal is known for his expertise in transformative leadership, driving profitable growth while focusing on employee ownership and empowerment. He says he strives to have a purposeful influence on positive performance and execution. He's a recently retired four-star admiral who spearheaded the United States Navy's Get Real, Get Better Culture Initiative, which has achieved major performance improvements in areas including F-18 strike fighter readiness, surface ship maintenance, and supply chain and logistics operations. Acting on the imperative to significantly improve competitive advantage, Admiral Bill Lesher partnered with many exceptional Navy leaders to build a culture of learning, continuous improvement, and effective problem solving. He has commanded at the squadron, wing and strike group levels, and is a test pilot who holds systems and aeronautical engineering degrees and an MBA from Harvard Business School. In his last role, he served as the Navy's Vice Chief and is recognized as one of the Navy's most dynamic and inspiring leaders. Please welcome Vicente Renal and Admiral Bill Lesher to the stage. Well, Vicente, it is great to join you today, and I'm really looking forward to learning from your journey and your experience today. You know, as we start, I'd first like to thank Larry and the full GE team, Linda, Whitney, Lauren, for putting together such an amazing day of conversation and learning. Uh, I think it's been fun, it's been thought-provoking, which is a great combination. So thank you for that. Vicente? Yeah, no, I fully, uh, fully agree with that. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been a great, great day so far. Yes, yeah, very good. So Vicente and I have the honor of uh, finishing the day strong and bringing us home. And so we thought we would share a bit of our experience on scaling the lean mindset to achieve consistently strong organization and cultural performance. Vicente, I know you've been on this journey for quite some time. So if you could tell us a bit, what laid the foundation for you? And where is Ingersoll Rand in your transformation journey right now? Sure, Bill. I, uh, so my, uh, my lean experience really began almost 30 years ago uh, when I was at MIT doing my, uh, my master's degree. And I got a chance to really work on an initiative that it was called the Lean Aerospace Initiative, which was how do you distill the lean principles that were so prevalent in the automotive industry, known to be a high volume, high mix, and apply that into a low volume, low mix kind of type of industry. And, and for me, it was a very big awakening on my learning journey through the career. Uh, after I finished that and wrote a 300-page thesis that all of you are welcome to read it, and don't, don't, don't be bored with it, but uh, I, uh, I decided to take a job in the aerospace industry and really more with the journey of learning more and learning how can I apply. So I went to work for a company called Ally Signal that at the time led by Larry Bossidi, an ex-GE person, that it was transforming uh, that company into what became a very solid compounder. Uh, but for me, it was more how to apply lean. Uh, so I took a job as an hourly supervisor. Uh, so I had 25 hourly workers, and for me, it was the best experience I, I ever had to be able to create that foundation. That continued to be the lean journey of knowing more, and I tried to go to companies that I could continue to learn, and that's how I landed uh, to work at Danaher and, and learning from Larry what lean leadership is all about. And that then obviously led me into eventually work at the company that I am today, which we'll talk a little bit more about our transformation here. So yeah. it's, been a, it's been a great journey of just continuous learning, just like you, Bill. 
Awesome. And, and I think uh, you and I have spoken a lot about the transformation that you have done at the Navy in terms of that multi-year journey, journey implementing Lean, uh, combining with Lean problem solving approaches, teaching, learning, educating, driving that mindset to be very unique. And for me, it was uh, very interesting speaking with you over the past uh, 24 hours. <laughs> Uh, and I think it'll be great if you talk about, you know, what triggered the Navy's transformation journey and how did you experience with the lean uh, mindset and approach that really helped you to get there? Yes, great starting question. Um, I was first exposed to lean from a practitioner perspective a little bit later in life than you were. So I was a mid-level, mid to senior level leader in the Navy, a squadron commanding officer or wing commodore in the early 2000s when the Navy first embraced the lean approach to get after weak performance in the production of trained aviators and in the aircraft readiness, a proportion of our fleet that was flyable and available. And we embraced in the early 2000s under the sponsorship of two fairly senior admirals, two three-star admirals. And what's noteworthy about that initial exposure to me for lean is A, that it was successful, and B, it did not stick. Right? So over a course of a number of years, we achieved significant success, but when those three-star sponsors moved on, and when the Navy's priorities and focus evolved to the global war on terror, that impact was very much diminished and the lessons were very much diminished. This made an impression on me and a number of other leaders that continued in the Navy from there about the real importance of developing culture and mindset as a deeper foundation to create enduring advantage and enduring impact. Flash forward to 2018, Again, in aviation, we had sustained weak performance in F-18 readiness, the jet that you saw come across the screen here at the beginning. Um, we, for a decade, we had 250 flyable F-18s as the inventory was much larger than that and growing until by 2018, almost half the fleet in the operational force was unavailable to fly on any given day for a number of reasons. Um, and we had 55% mission capable of the inventory. So that's a lot of down jets. That's a lot of taxpayer investment that's not flyable and it's not mission ready. Secretary of Defense Mattis came in as a new secretary. He had a strong readiness focus. He said, Navy and Air Force, which was, not, which was generally similar performance, I need you to get to the level of readiness that will credibly deter conflict that's of your mission. And I need you to do it in a year, 80% mission capable. So for the Navy, that direction was to go from a decade of 250 flyable jets to 341 jets in a year. And I can tell you our traditional response would have been the classic muscle through the friction, let's work harder, let's work longer, let's get more inputs, let's attack that issue. What was helpfully different in 2018 was two things. We had a small cohort of leaders who were exposed to that initial lean journey in the early 2000s who understood the power and the potential of a lean approach. And as well, through a digital transformation initiative, we had early nascent learning with digital tools, data, analytics, driver-based performance management that we subsequently learned were quite powerful for amplifying the effectiveness of life. Driver-based performance management is the concept where if the tier one outcome is that 341 jet North Star outcome, what are the tier two drivers of that? People, parts, and repair velocity. What are the tier three drivers of that, tier four? create a hierarchy of performance drivers, and that, which essentially becomes a driver tree. And what this illuminated for us helpfully at the beginning, the driver tree showed us that the traditional approach of working harder and adding more inputs, when combined with the analytic models that were performing well at that time in predicting readiness based on today's performance drivers, it showed us we would not get there. And this was the genesis of what we came to call the get real moment get real about our understanding, our actual performance drivers and our actual capability. And it was the genesis of the get real litmus test. The get real litmus test is whether leaders sufficiently understand the performance drivers to confidently predict and transparently communicate future performance. Two elements to the litmus test. Do you understand your performance drivers and can you predict future performance? And the behavior piece to it. Do you have the courageous communication to embrace the red, we've talked about earlier today, to transparently role model and reward transparency and safety in talking about tough issues. And the team as well, the courage to not appear perfect, to not fear I always have the answers, to say, hey, we are in the process of learning. 
So that get real litmus test we learned was an unequivocal prerequisite for improvement. If we hide weak performance from each other, we will fail. These driver trees also, and these digital approaches, were also quite powerful for the get better part of our journey. And we saw, for example, in terms of focusing data and focusing effort. So the US Navy, I bet, virtually like everybody in the room, is awash in data. And so much data that sometimes it slows down our problem solving process, or even mass solutions. The driver trees were quite powerful for helping us be selective about which data and how much were required to understand the situation sufficiently to do some basic analytic modeling, predictive prescriptive modeling. So the standard was statistical validity at speed and not analytic perfection. And then with that practical, timely approach to using data, our teams were able to develop and then continuously refine gap closure plans. And this is where we learned about focusing effort. The gap closure plans were, as we came to describe them, a relentless hunt for leverage. Right? Of all the many drivers in this driver tree at the various tier levels, which are, most, which are the essential few? Which are most consequentially driving a 341 up jets? And then we focused effort there. We focused improvement scripts, improvement sprints that were scoped for velocity of learning, not for boiling the ocean. Develop the learning, show wins, and scale the impact. And this was essentially the foundation of our get real, get better approach. The other power of understanding what matters most in those drivers is that the, the Navy was able to elevate our gaze outside our own ecosphere to find world-class performance where it matters most in generating up jets. And I would, I would highlight for you just two examples of that created over 50% of our gap closure. When we adopted the maintenance operations center concept from the commercial airlines, which is an approach, a powerful approach for integrating requirements and allocating scarce resources for impact at speed, that initiative rather than the Navy was 30% of our gap closure. Another 20% came from adopting best in class maintenance repair and overhaul procedures to bring velocity of maintenance into our squadrons on one check, one 84 day check it was 50% of our scheduled maintenance. Collapsed that from 14 days to a three-day playbook. Two changes, not on a horizon prior to embrace the red, find leverage, drove the gap closure. So I would highlight that as some of the continuous improvement framework elements that drove us. Very quickly, two mindset elements that came from the F-18 journey were about ownership and leadership. Mm -hmm. We learned quickly in this journey that complex cross-functional tasks, which I bet for everybody in the room are your most significant opportunities. Complex cross-functional tasks done by committee is a recipe for failure. And we learned that, we, that ownership and accountability is key to driving the outsized breakthrough performance. And so we changed the approach at aviation from the Naval Aviation Enterprise being run by three admirals, a supply chain admiral, an engineering systems command admiral, and an organized train and equip admiral, to the organized train and equip admiral, also known as the air boss, as the single supported, accountable individual for delivering 341 jets. So key to this was a green and the other admirals were accountable support team. So we went to a supported support team concept. Air boss, you're the accountable supported commander for 341. The other admirals and every block on the driver tree had a name, not an office, not a function, a name. And they were the accountable support team commanders, accountable to the air boss to deliver their gap closure tasks. So key to that was a green on those accountability relationships, often outside current approach, and high velocity barrier resolution in that group. So we had a standard fix or elevate. If any barrier prevented you from completing your gap closure task, fix it internally. If unable to, elevate at speed to standard. And our standard was you elevate with specificity. Boss, if we work on this barrier, will achieve this change outcome in this time frame with this confidence factor. And you elevate with accountability. We're elevated to an individual, not an office, in a specific time frame. So that ownership element was key. And then the last thing I would highlight is a leadership piece, which I think is well known to everybody in this group, which is change of that magnitude in terms of performance and behavior has to be inspired and led. It's not managed. And so our leaders spent quite a bit of time with position and passion energy and time commitment to lead this with dialogue. The dialogue was centered on learning and burial removal, not blame, uh, and tone. And uh, recurrently in operating reviews and elsewhere, that's how our leaders led. 
asking simple questions or about learning and barrier removal. The last thing I would highlight is the other thing we thought was important was to talk about the emotion of learning, right? So we found when you transparently test our self-talk that our activity is actually creating gap closure. Those types of conversation should be purposeful, they should be respectful, they should be psychologically safe, and they're often uncomfortable because that's what learning feels like in a mission-focused organization. And so we talked about that. Hey, don't feel bad or feel like we should run away from these uncomfortable conversations because that's what right looks like. Purposeful, respectful, often uncomfortable conversations where we're just being honest with each other and teaching what gap closure looks like well. So Vincente, you have an employee base of 20,000 highly engaged employees, also with a very much of an ownership mindset. So you can tell us a little bit about what the journey was to get there and what that environment looks like. Sure, sure, Bill. So uh, uh, definitely the, the highly engaged employee with the ownership mindset resonates really well with us because that's our, our, our culture. But if I step back, when I took over as CEO in 2016, let me just kind of give you some leading indicators as to how the company was looking back then. We decided to create a baseline and like Larry said, bring the red to the, to the, to the sunshine and make it ugly. So we did an employee engagement survey. We were looking for leading indicators as to why the company was not performing. Employee engagement said that uh, we were in the 19th percentile of all manufacturing companies. Very low engagement scores. Turnover, quit rate, ra quit rate ratio for employee base globally in the high teens. So people were leaving low engagement scores, high debt, six to seven times lever, uh, and, uh, and safety was horrendous. So clearly, you could tell something was wrong. That's why it's, it's important, this mindset. Fast forward to today, uh, the company looks incredibly different. You know, just six years later, employee engagement were in the top 10 percentile across all manufacturing companies, always improving. Participation rate of 20,000 employees is in the 95%. So employees, they, they want to raise their voice. Safety were 70% better than any world-class best industrial uh, data that we can find and quit rate turnover to less than 3%, even during the COVID days. So it's all about the how and what we accomplish that. And I think it is a lot about the leadership, the presence, the ability to have a process, the ability to have some tools that you can engage employees in a constant way every single week, every single day, and making sure that they're thinking through the continuous improvement activities that we can generate. In our case, we decided also to infuse uh, an accelerant. And the accelerant for us is equity. So we gave equity to all employees in the company. Uh, we have now given roughly $275 million of equity uh, to the employee base. This is for non-management equity participants. So all 20,000 employees at Ingersoll Rand, they're owners of Ingersoll Rand shares. Uh, it is not, we're not an ESOP company. We're a company that basically provides that equity in a two-year vesting cycle. And it is done as kind of like a founder's grant as we are uh, obviously becoming a, a fairly new company. That $275 million of equity that we provided to employees is now worth close to $700 million. So clearly employees have seen the benefit of getting everyone aligned to a specific metrics, a specific KPIs that we execute on a constant basis through our process that we call IRX, or Ingersoll Rand Execution Excellence Process, that we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And that is really what has accelerated the performance of really changing that mindset where now employees, they think about continuous improvement every single day at all levels in the organization, clearly in the factory, uh, most, mostly participant, as Jim said, you know, in Toyota production system is kind of bottoms up uh, versus top down. And, uh, and I think it's just one of those that we feel we're at the very early stages of our cycle and this continuous improvement, improvement will allow us to continue to accelerate that performance. Yeah. So I think, I think in terms of these lean principles uh, that, that you spoke about uh, very well, Bill, you've been a very uh, adv great advocate about the lean principles, the engagement, the ownership mindset, the problem solving tools. Can you tell us more about how the Navy acted on the initial F-18 uh, learning to accelerate this transformation mindset across the Navy? Absolutely, and I'll try and do so briefly. <laughs> um, although I feel real passion for this, obviously, as well. So the F-18 journey, for us showed the, really the remarkable power of combining lean and continuous improvement framework principles with some analytic approaches and new leadership and behavior, um, new leadership and collaboration behaviors. 
you know, the basic things I talked about, a rigorous mission-focused fo North Star that Secretary Mattis gave us to provide that compelling urgency to learn, a get real understanding of baseline performance and embrace the red transparency to find what to get better with, a get better relentless hunt for leverage and traction using analytics to amplify the power of lean, a clear sense of ownership and high velocity barrier removal. And we learned that breakthrough improvement most consequentially results from concentrating to the to the consequential, the leverage, and high velocity barrier removal. And then the leadership piece, leadership focused on learning and barrier removal. So we then scaled that into surface ship maintenance, which had been large depot maintenance availabilities on our ships, which had been performing weekly for a decade. Significant improvement, 50, 58% improvement in on-time delivery over two years, days of maintenance delay cut in less than half. We then brought it into our nuclear attack submarine fleet, achieved a significant improvement in combat readiness that's at a classified level. We brought it into our supply chain and achieved $800 million of value capture and a better improving supply chain with these principles. As we did that, we couldn't help but notice across all those elements that there were common behaviors that were systematic in creating the variability in our performance. Our worst, our weakest performers showed these, these types of behaviors. We have a strong foundational culture of honor, courage, commitment but there were traditional elements of behavior that were hindering us. And so in 2022, we acted on that awareness to scale out a standard, a leadership standard. We call it a get real, get better leadership standard. In a nutshell, it wasn't intellectually elegant, big, it was as simple as we could make it. We said, what are the critical few essential behaviors most consequentially different from our traditional behavior? Act transparently, which is a, a leadership behavior. Focus on what matters most, the problem solving behavior build learning teams, the collaboration behavior. And we rolled that out with a proven structure. So a simple framework, each of them had clear standards. So it's not like, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if we were more transparent, or how, how cool would it be if we solved problems better? There's clear detail and standards that anyone can measure themselves against for this framework. And then we used a proven problem-solving framework, systems, tools, symbols, and stories. Systems like talent management, uh, learning continuum, tools like playbooks, surveys, uh, promotion precepts, symbols, promotion announcements, leadership awards, unit awards, and stories. Um, so we rolled that out across that uh, in, 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 uh, in an integrated way. Um, and we also chose to roll it out from the top down, right? Because there's a lot of personal risk to embrace the red, to do other elements, and so we wanted to show that the way we're rolling it out is role modeling from the top. So you and I would have a conversation and then roll it down from there. And each of those conversations had specific standards. Here's the behavior, here's the opposite behavior, here's the counterfeit behavior. So an opposite behavior would be when, for example, I told, an opposite get real behavior would, would be when I told Giannis last night that I could take him in the paint at any time, at will. <laughs> so it's not factual. A counterfeit behavior would be when voice and action are not the same. But through that approach, the, the essential fuel, clear standards, uh, and, a, and a, a proven change management framework, that's how the Navy's working to scale it. Ingersoll Rand also has a very interesting framework, uh, Vincente. So can you tell us a little bit about the from to there and what hurdles you faced in getting through that? Yeah, so I think uh, Ingersoll Rand uh, Execution Excellence Tool, or IRX, we like to say that uh, it is simple to the point of being offensive. And, and when you think about it, it's basically simple tools like every factory, we have about 120 factories across the world, and every, every single factory they have safety, quality, delivery, inventory, productivity, dashboards that they track every day. It's about understanding are you winning or are you losing every day. Same thing as kind of what many of the other panelists have been talking about. What we also do is that for the non-factory, we have impact daily management. Impact daily management, it's a way on how we cascade down uh, basically the strategy into one-year objectives and then into, into weekly executional uh, KPIs where the teams get together for 45 minutes and cross-functional team, and they are like their own board of directors for that specific problem that they're trying to solve. And at any, time, any point in time, we have about 350 of those happening every single week. So it's a very rapid cycle, very rapid way for us to be able to coach and train and mentor leaders how to execute, how to become visible, how to drive that tone at the top, uh, regardless of what the top in terms of layers might be. And I think that really creates those very unique moments of truth that I think are so essential 
when you're trying to change the mindset and the culture of companies. So I think for us, IRX is that. It's a very simple way on how we take that ownership mindset, which we think is an accelerant, and take the IRX to be able to allow us to execute across a multitude of things. It could be diversity, equity, inclusion. It could be sustainability. It could be how we integrate acquisitions. We're very acquisitive. We integrated four, we have acquired and integrated 40 companies over the past you know, three years. So it's, it's about that cadence of execution that we're trying to drive because ultimately our employees are saying that Ingress of Rand were 160, 170 year old startup company. They wanna know that we're agile, that we're nimble, that we think differently, that we're very unique in this environment. So I think with that, uh, you know, culture and behavior challenge in a transformation build, tone at the top, what are some of the challenges that you face during this transformation and how you drove that tone from the top? Yeah, very briefly to leave you some time as well. Um, but uh, so the Navy learned there's real hurdles and challenges, right? We failed the first time in the early 2000s, it didn't stick. Um, the challenges we see start with the fundamental, hey, why do I need to change? We're the strongest Navy in the world, we're, we're good to go. And so there's an imperative for a leadership call to action to bring alive a sense of urgency, the imperative to accelerate advantage from a position of leadership and not win an extremis, the imperative to bring alive a sense of urgency to get in front of strategic disruption in technology, people skills, geopolitics. So strong leadership engagement and communication on that. I did a listening tour before a rollout across the fleet, and the idea was, hey, I want to get real about get real, get better. Why is this hard? How is this going to work? And I heard things such as, hey, we already do this. And so I had some great conversations, but not to standard, right? Because the standard is where the power is. Or real distrust that I can embrace the red and not get be penalized for that. And so this has a premium on leaders, role modeling, consistency, the behavior, rewarding it, challenging the old behavior, proving the power of get real, get better by solving the problems that most matter to our sailors. So um, that was a continuous journey and we're powering through it. We have a superb team of leaders working, I would say, with confidence and humility, which is, I think, the secret sauce. You know, the humility to learn, the confidence we're on the right vector to bring this forward. Um, so, Vincente, uh, I, I think we're up, her, up in time, so I appreciate it. It would be a great, uh, great exchange. And